Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building, Michael Eric Dyson. The Welcome good back, brother, son. Michael Eric Dyson. Man, man, it's good to be up here with y'all. I see you got a nice uh, little book in your hand. You you just handed it to me, and now I'm so intrigued. I, I want to start reading this I now. I know, man. This thing is off the hook. Veronica Chambers is an extraordinary woman. She did that book, that edited book, uh, collection essays on Michelle Obama that did so well last year. And then this new book, look, it's hot off the press. It ain't even out yet. It come out next month called Queen Bee, A Celebration of the Power and Creativity of Beyonce Knowles Carter. Beyonce. And I got an essay in there. All right, called the King of Pop and the Queen of Everything. Okay. Mm. And my argument is that Beyonce snatched the crown from Michael Jackson. I saw him at his height. I don't know if y'all went to his concerts and saw him at his height, but I did. <sighs> Not and he was that. extraordinary. He was a genius. But what she's doing is on another level. I mean, nonstop, two, two and a half hours. Uh, you know, you know that old thing that said that Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers were partners, you know, back in the day. And she did everything Fred Astaire did except backwards and in high heels. And that's what I feel about Beyonce, an extraordinary genius. She doesn't get credit for the remarkable way in which she changed the musical vocabulary of contemporary art. Like, I think she's a godmother for some of the mumble rappers, not in terms of content, but in cadence, that rap singing she did, uh, the way in which she changed the the whole genre with a female-centered presence and then bringing her blackness along unapologetically, and then what she did at Coachella, turning it into Beachella. I mean, it's just... Mm -hmm. Phenomenal what she has done. So it's a celebration of her genius, and my essay uh, does that. I'm on record as saying I think that she's a better performer than Michael Jackson. But I, you know, I didn't see Michael in concert. But I just compare I like you know the soup like Michael at the Super Bowl to Beyonce at the Super Bowl, Motown 25 to right. Beachella. Like I just compare those type of things, and I'm right. like I I just think she's better on stage. She she absolutely is. I did see them at their height. Mm-hmm. The only time I met I met Michael Jackson one time in the bathroom at Johnny Cochran's funeral, and he said. Uh, you know, he's washing his hands. I was like, man, Mike, you know, we born the same year. And he was like, I like how you talk on TV. <laughs> I said, what did I say? I said, well, I like how you sing on stage. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I since, mean, the extraordinary dude. Since you said that she took the crown from Michael Jackson, what mm-hmm. do you think about all this Finding Neverland controversy with this documentary that HBO is going to show about Michael Jackson? Yeah, you know, it's tough, isn't it? Michael was a great icon, an extraordinary genius. 1958, Madonna. Prince Michael Jackson. I mean, happens to be my year too, but I ain't putting myself in their league. Just extraordinary creativity was born in that year. And yet, we know that Michael had tremendous traumas. Did he have vitiligo? Certainly, in terms of his skin and melanin, but he also had self-hatred because his father deposited that in his subconscious. He didn't think he was very handsome or he told him he was ugly and he chided him. And then Michael began to have spooky European ideals transplanted onto his face. Was he involved with children? That's what the documentary says. Those two guys, when they were younger, said it wasn't wasn't true. But we know what happens when you're younger and you're seduced and the hypnotic sway of fame and celebrity may preclude you from telling the truth or your parents got bought out and then they sold you out. All of that is true, but think about it. Hanging out with kids like that at that age, it ain't it ain't it ain't something that we would recommend. It's not something that we would do for our own kids. It's not normal. It, 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 it ain't. And if it is normal, it's pathological. So the thing is, we have to be open and honest. It's hard to reckon with the flaws of our great heroes. And all of us as human beings are flawed, but we got to go where the evidence, you know, tracks us. But that's important, where the evidence tracks us. Because we're living in a Me Too generation that is extremely important in terms of reckoning with the flaws, of, especially of toxic masculinity, mm-hmm. of poisonous patriarchy, and how men have had free, uh, if you will, free ways to do everything that we do that are often messed up and jacked up. At the same time, you can't just have an allegation and then your career is done. Or- you can't just disappear after somebody said something. You know, the the mantras out now believe women. And I understand what that means. That means that women have historically been not acknowledged, have been denied, have been delegitimated in a culture that refuses to acknowledge their humanity or that the words they say are true or to take at face value what they mean. I get that. At the same time, you know, it doesn't mean that people haven't been in complicated situations where nuance is called for. Believe people who tell the truth, because whether man or woman. And we know that's very complicated. Believe black people, yeah? Believe black people who tell the truth. 
And and when, when we have the state of evidence here now that you can merely make an allegation and somebody disappear, I think that's problematic. I don't think that's the best ideals of feminism. I think feminism at its height, and I know a lot of people think that's controversial. I don't think so at all. Feminism is about the recognition of women. It's about putting forth the principle of emancipation for all human beings who happen to be women. And it's dealing with gender as the predicate for our social uh, examination of issues that continue to be shunted to the periphery or denied legitimacy in our own lives and socially speaking. But at the same time, you can't use Me Too as an adjudication of competing claims about good dates or bad dates. It can't resolve uh, horrible sex. It can't resolve the fact that it's complicated. I am 60 years old. I have never in my life asked a woman to have sex. Now, I know affirmative consent has developed because now we're living in an era where people have to say something explicitly. Mm -hmm. But there are other manifestations of consent rather than verbal. Mm -hmm. And I ain't got to say that. Y'all know what they are. Uh, But the problem is that when we have nonverbal consent... If a man engages in activity that he read off of a woman as somehow giving him implied consent, then the necessity of affirmative consent really puts that in a different arena. No, say what you're talking about. Say whether it's true or not. Say whether you accept it or not. But in my generation, you ask a woman for sex, she'll kick you out to bed. Bruh. You're you, you, ruining you, the mood. You, what you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, you don't, you don't. You can't see I'm ready. But see, me seeing you ready may be read differently by me than you. But if it's a mutually agreed upon erotic moment where the entanglement is reciprocal and no violence is involved, then that's one thing. So it's very complicated. We want to bring science to poetry. And it's not that we shouldn't have a serious recognition of the rights and responsibility of each human being involved in an affair of the heart. But I think we have gotten off the rails here by not grappling with the nuanced, complicated ways in which sex and eroticism and romance get involved. Take, for instance, the Aziz Ansari case. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you do you check all the boxes. Are you all right? Are you feeling good? And is this something that we can both mutually agree upon? What about if you have buyer's remorse the next day? Like I did it then, but now I don't feel the same. Well, when we did it, when we engaged in a sexual congress, when we engaged in a mutually agreed upon, you know, erotic adventure, at that moment, it seemed to be fine. If it's not fine later, then we have to grapple with that. Did I did I imply something? Did I force coercively uh, engage you? Did I try to push you in a way that was uncomfortable? You did we talk about it? All that is necessary to talk about. But to hold people legally accountable or even morally accountable in ways that don't take that nuance into account is problematic. There has to be a spectrum between a guy who tells a woman she's beautiful and it makes her uncomfortable and a guy who rapes a woman. There's a spectrum. There's a continuum. And if we make everything everything, then nothing is anything. Mm. So we've got to figure out a way to acknowledge the, the context of sex. If you want to be nuanced about anything in this country, it's got to be sex. And look, I'm talking about this as a guy. I wrote a book called Why I Love Black Women when a lot of people were like, why are you singling out black women as opposed to Italian women? Uh, Because I'm a black man seeing what black women are being treated like. And I want to speak to that. I wrote a book about Bill Cosby when Negroes had death threats against me when I was on book tour because they said I was trying to take down an icon. So you ain't talking to somebody who ain't been on the front edge talking about sexism. I got kicked out of a church when I was 23 years old because I was trying to ordain three women. So I'm on that cutting edge in that sense. That doesn't mean that, therefore, I'm exempt from critique or that rigorous moral uh, scrutiny shouldn't be applied or that now we're not in a different age we are. But let's not pretend we ain't in the age we are now and that a different age prevailed not long ago. Do we have amnesty? Do we say, hey, rules used to be this way, not it unchanged up. Now we're retroactively going back and holding people accountable for, now now don't get me wrong here, not for explicit sins, not for problems, not for legally challengeable activities and behaviors that should be held to the highest account. But when we're talking about nuance and interpretation, do you like it, do you not like it? No means no, period. Mm -hmm. And yet in the interaction between men and women, many people who turn people down 25 times are now married with three kids. Right. That's the kind of reality of sex that we're not seeing taken uh, in a serious fashion, in a nuanced way in the broader public discourse about that. I know we got off of that on the Michael Jackson thing, 
but the, the, the Michael Jackson thing to me is about nuance and complication and being willing to face up to the flaws of our iconic figures and at the same time seed their humanity and then figure out what to do from there. No, you said a lot. There's three things I want to say. Uh, right. Number one, I, I, I agree. I, I think you should listen to everybody. Right. Listen to all women but believe all proof. Right. Um, uh, two, I, I think the Michael Jackson thing is unethical mm-hmm. only because those guys did get on the stand and say, hey, Nothing happened. And they right. said that all through their adulthood. Even the guy's mom said he right. never even said nothing happened right. to Michael. And uh, third, yes, we're not acknowledging that culture has changed. We grew that up in can. a totally the 80s and 90s was totally different than now with language, right. with action, everything. Right. And that, and let me address all of those. You're absolutely right, right, with the Michael Jackson in terms of his, you know, unethical uh, practice there in regard to that documentary. The broader issue, however, is with Michael's behavior with young people and with trying to relive a childhood that he was denied. And I talk about that in my essay on uh, on Beyonce and Michael Jackson, that he had two childhoods and both of them were imagined. He was like Benjamin Button, right? He's like aging in reverse, mm-hmm. like born a prodigy at 10 years old. The lethal ferocity, the intense passion of his voice, like reinterpreting Smokey Robinson at 10 years old. He's a man child. Mm-hmm. He's, he's a freak of nature. And then as he got older, he got younger. He missed his childhood. He He missed missed the childhood, but so did Sammy Davis. So did a lot of people, right? How do you compensate for that? So there were were troubling signs about his potential relationship to young people. In the same way, we look at R. Kelly and talk about the clear signs that are there. It's it's uncomfortable, but we have to acknowledge that. But so there's a legal and a moral. And, and a moral and ethical consideration that has to be taken into account, I think you make a compelling point. In regard to the difference in age, man, and I'm much older than you, mm-hmm. right? Imagine at 60 years old, looking at the landscape now and, and saying that men have to reckon. I am not saying that men do not have to reckon. I believe absolutely, because I've been saying that since I've been a young man in the ministry. And look, I come from the ministry where we know there were complicated sexual practices, and on the one hand, was there exploitation of, of, of men in the pulpit uh, for women who were in the pews? Absolutely. Were there ways in which men used the extraordinary power we possessed to deploy that in defense of our erotic entanglements? Absolutely. But there were also women hollering. They, they, right? right? When Martin Luther King Jr. is out there, white women who were married from Westchester handing him notes. Mm. So I'm saying that you can't both assert the necessity of the agency of human beings, especially women as agents of their own sexual desire and then deny that agency when it comes time to talk about culpability and responsibility and mutuality. And that's why I said earlier about buyer's remorse. Here we are in an age now where a relationship gone wrong is now often immediately consigned to the the heat bin of me too. No, it could have been a wrong relationship. It could have been you were wrong for that dude. He was wrong for you. Y'all got into arguments. It was it was it was nasty. It was vicious. We have to ne- negotiate that. But everything can't be adjudicated through me too. Now I know. I don't know that defender, that happens that often, but I will say that it well, is important that women are able to feel like they can speak up now because for absolutely. so long it's been, well, this is just part of what the business is. No. Well, this is just what happens. I'm not down and with a that. lot of times you're not in a position of power, so you feel like if I say something, this could affect my whole career. So it is important and that we encourage women Absolutely. when there's bad behavior to be able to feel uh, that they have power to speak about it and that, that they will be supported. Because I still right. see when women say things, people don't believe them. They think that they're just trying to, you know, get some clout off of right. saying something. Right. So it is a different time for women who, and think of all the women who still won't come forward. That's or right. still are too scared to do that. I think those numbers are far greater than somebody that will say something like, oh, I dated him and I had buyer's remorse the next day. Well, that's an excellent critique of me. What I'm trying to say, I agree with everything you just said. I'm not denying the legitimacy of women having the voice now to come forward, to say things that historically they have been discouraged from saying, to suppress in themselves a consciousness of what happened, to deny to themselves an experience that was so horrible because of their deference to don't bring the man down or we love black men as black women, so we don't want to make their careers vulnerable to rebuff by white supremacists who are out to get them anyway. Right. That's why I'm saying when I wrote a book Mm -hmm. on Bill Cosby and I included Andrea Constanz you know, remarks about him and then her early claims about what he had done. I gave three to four pages in a book at the very beginning of that and people dogging me, right? right. So so I think you're absolutely right. But to this and day, all of people us men, still think that Bill Cosby was trying to buy a network and they, it was a conspiracy. Nobody really yeah. believes that. No, well, people that's... really still say that. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's insane. But But so that <laughs> point you're talking about is absolutely right. But balance that against 
I'm talking about the more complicated mm -hmm. interactions. I'm not talking about the explicit ones. What happens when somebody says, this is what happened? This is what he did to me. He said, I was right there. That ain't what happened. Right. Right. So that th at that level, that's not simply about the politics of power alone. That's not about the interpretation of masculinity and a toxic sense of patriarchy where men's lives automatically count and women's don't. That's at a level of intimate exchange between a man and a woman. And we have to decide now how things went down. Could we have a legitimate disagreement about what happened? I'm not talking about rape. I'm not talking about sexual abuse. I'm talking about the relationship between men and women that lead often to complicated relationships that need to be uh, uh, interpreted in a far more, you know, nuanced and complex matter. So I'm not saying don't believe women, uh -huh. but I'm saying look at what's happening now with many claims when I, I, I brought up the Aziz Ansari. So, you know, how, how do we adjudicate that? How do we how do we talk about that? How do so we talk about a case? You can't take Aziz and put him in the category with R. Kelly. Right, uh, but it often is, though. But there's no difference. Oh, no, difference. there's definitely I've not. I've got colleagues who have suffered, who have lost jobs, right? And I'm not one of these, oh, oh, men are going down. Because if women are finally speaking up and the atrocious and horrible sins to which they have been subject and the evil, let's just name it for what it is of the evil of denying women legitimate agency and the exercise of their freedom and emancipation because they have to be in an unprincipled fashion deferential to men. I ain't talking about none of that. I'm talking about at the everyday level where men and women get together and now those relationships have been pressured legitimately so by an awareness that I can't just do what I want to do, that it has to be uh, in line with some serious moral and ethical principles that will help me, guide me in how I treat another human being. And at the same time, though, when you've got the intimate relationships between men and women who disagree, who have relationships, who fight, feminism can't keep men and women from fighting each other, not physically, disagreeing with each other. It means that men's men won't have the last say so in the relationship. It doesn't mean the relationship ain't going to be janky. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean the relationship won't be complicated. If that's the case, women would get along with all women. They don't. The, the reality is, is that we are not, we cannot resolve the infinite complexity of human relationality and the intimate relations of sex with a resort to a kind of all or nothing approach. And I think that's part of the problem. Right. It's the same thing with the cancel culture. I got the same problem with the cancel culture. Yeah. Cancel this for women. First of all, you cancel Whitney Houston. Now you have to uncancel her. Now you miss her. You have to cancel Quincy Jones or Harry Belafonte. You have to qu uh, cancel Martin Luther King. They had to cancel Martin Luther King all the time. <laughs> You're a sellout. And guess what? Malcolm X was trying to cancel him. He's the greatest tool the white man has ever Uncle had. Uncle Tom. All yeah. that. Then Malcolm got canceled by people who disagreed with him. So I just think that this zero tolerance, by the way, which is a right wing concept, it's not a progressive one. Zero tolerance. I will never at all acknowledge or tolerate what's going on. And, and look at this. The nuance has to be brought not only in terms of sex, but in terms of race. I look at the governor's, you know, fiasco over there and lieutenant governor's fiasco. And again, he's been charged by the lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax, has been charged by two women, very credible women, mm -hmm. about what happened there. Right. And then he says, no, it didn't happen. How do So what do we do? We, do we go back? Well, yes. He says he calls for an FBI investigation. That, of course, must happen. So when we have an investigation, I just think black people have to be very wary of an allegation is all it takes for you to go down. That's Can we have some proof? Can we have some evidence? Can we have some marshalling effects? Can we put it in an interpretive framework where we now begin to make claims on either side? And yes, now the preponderance of evidence or the overwhelming narrative here leads to the belief or the conclusion that what happened there was X, Y, and Z. If we don't have that... We got to remember history when exactly. that's him, he did it, and you're too. done, you're, yeah. you're dismissed. And I don't want to say, again, these are two black women. So let's acknowledge that black women have not been heard, have not been listened to, and must be heard. But how do you make the conscious choice to make a decision about what happened unless you investigate, unless you think about it? And again, this is where nuance and complication are there. And the same with the cancel culture. Mm -hmm. I'm so, I, I love young people. I ride with them. I write books about hip hop. But canceling, that's some white supremacist notion to me. First of all, you can't cancel nobody. You ain't got no subscription to a magazine <laughs> or a credit card. You ain't canceling nothing. And if you want to cancel something, cancel Donald Trump. How idiotic is that? Because you can't cancel Trump. He's there politically. He's an existential and empirical fact that you can't dismiss because I'm done with you. Read the hand. Digital culture cannot deal with analog realities, it seems to me. And an analog reality here is 
there are persistent social facts and features of our of our existence that have to be Ooh. dealt with. Oh, say that again. Digital culture can't handle analog facts sometimes. Ooh. I mean, and that's what the deal is, right? Because here we are, we canceling. There was some analog canceling going on too. I mentioned Malcolm X, who was murdered by people who were intolerant of his viewpoint. Canceled him. Now, now young people will tell me that's a metaphor. But the metaphor to me is wrought. It's 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 not only is it flawed? I think it's 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 especially flawed because it borrows from the very logic we want to oppose, right? White supremacy wants to cancel people out, hang you, lynch you, castrate you, remove you, cancel. No, argue, put them in a in a in a, in a moral box and say this is problematic. Let's resist them. But the, but the impulse to cancel to me is borrowed from the very people we want to resist. And plus, think about it: if a dude Martin Luther King Jr. was coming, he went to live in Chicago, Illinois, for. A few months, right? He was trying to show I'm gonna I'm gonna live where people who are in slums live. He went there. They were going out one day for a march, and some of the people who lived in the slums with him went out the door. A white man spit on them. Dude was about to haul off and just just knock him off, right? King said, "Wait a minute. You live in every day in a place that has poor infrastructure. You ain't got no heat in your crib. You ain't got no running water. But you mad because somebody spit on you, right? The structural stuff is murdering you every day." Right. Think about it. Think about where to direct your animus, your hostility, your anger. Let it be more redemptive, restorative and constructive. So King was saying there are bigger fish to fry. Let's deal with the underlying issue. That doesn't mean that blackface is not an issue. It's problematic. But how many white people have done blackface? A whole bunch more than want to acknowledge it. Is it problematic? Absolutely. Is it part of a ruinous racism? Absolutely. Is it part of racial hostility against black people? Absolutely. Is it, is it part of anti-blackness? Absolutely. But if this governor is there now and talking about, I got to wrestle with this issue, we know he's he's part of white privilege. He's unconscious in his bias. He's still talking about slaves as indentured servants. Mm -hmm. I mean, the madness is there. Mm -hmm. Let's hold him to account. But imagine if this guy stays in office and is forced to deal with race for the rest of his term in a way he wouldn't be forced otherwise. I'm just saying there are more complicated responses there than get rid of him. Look at the attorney general. The attorney general in that state has admitted, look, I did the blackface mm -hmm. too. Yeah, all of y'all need to come out the closet. But what's interesting, here's an attorney general who's more progressive. Cash bails he's trying to deal with, the way in which black people have been disproportionately targeted by a criminal justice system. So is it worth it for us to put him out of office and let the next white guy who doesn't have a blackface history come in and hurt millions more of black people, hundreds of thousands more of black people because of his policies than the symbolic expression of his racial animus. So basically I'm he's been saying, exposed, so let's hold him accountable. Let's hold him accountable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what he's done. Let's talk about all of us have flaws. Because look, people, I, I, I know you've been, people tried to cancel you. All I'm sure everybody every, in this every room. Year. Yeah. They tell me, the Negro, I'm going to cancel you. That's why I tell you, you, you ain't, I'm 20 bucks in. I'm 60 years old. I got a job. For real, I ain't, I ain't got t Twitter fingers on here <laughs> with this digital courage. You got spitting at me, trying to call me out my name. Cool. This is the problem again with the, the digital culture. In it's There's so much genius to it. There's so much amazing stuff to it. But it tempts young people to believe that sending a tweet is a serious intellectual affair that has been developed as a result of years of honed intelligence and reflection. Now, I'm not saying everybody got to be Shakespeare or Aristotle or Du Bois or Bell Hooks or Eddie Gloud or Cornell West or anybody who's been serious about it, the Reverend Dr. Frederick Haynes who's in here with me. I'm not saying everybody got to do that, right? I'm saying that we got to think seriously about the or, or Kimberly Crenshaw, we got to think seriously about developing resources and skills. And if you criticize somebody, you should do that. But to be nasty and vicious, this cancel culture, you're canceled, you're done. I'm, I'm just tired of the, the intolerance that young people show, especially young black people and trying to cancel each other. And then somebody going to cancel your black ass. Yes. <laughs> you trying to cancel somebody, then you're going to be the cancel lead. The, and then what's going to happen then? The great Amanda Seal said uh, cancel culture is real, but redemption culture should be real as well. Well, it is real as well, but the cancel culture to me... You shouldn't I, even I, get look, canceled, is what he's saying. I'm just saying even... the cancel... But you, first of all, you can't cancel nobody. What does that even mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you can't cancel <laughs> nobody. Right? You can't even cancel your bills. You can't even cancel the people <laughs> mm -hmm. living with you. What, what you should be saying is, I will put you in a particular situation where I hold you accountable. I want to resist you. I think you're problematic. You can't even cancel uh, uh, Donald Trump. Because I think the logic of canceling is derived from a white supremacist culture that believes that human beings are subject to our arbitrary will and caprice. And I think it's more deep than that. It's deeper than that. I think that's what makes people evolve, too. When you 
when you when you hold them accountable and you say, look, I'm going to hold you accountable. I want you to think about the things that you've done. Right. Think about the things that you said. Right. If that person really cares, I think that's what growth happens. Of, of course, because otherwise, look, 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 I'll tell you what cancel culture is. Young kids, second, third grade, getting kicked out. White folk canceling them every day. Mm. Right. Cancel them, throwing them out of school. Wait a minute. Johnny messed up. Little Shaquille messed up. Shanique was messed up. But. Can they get some redemption? Little little Johnny is get, little Sally is getting redemption. They ain't getting canceled. They're getting sent to not even probably to delinquents, you know, to to delinquency or or putting in a situation in a classroom where they are held separate from the other class. They are being talked to. They are being put in, put in time out. Negroes believe time out means the time I knock you out for what you did wrong and the time you wake up. That's time out. So the reality <laughs> is we've got to understand more complicated ways and approaches because, yeah, canceling somebody to me borrows from the logic of the very people that we hold as enemies or that are enemies to the process of development and evolution. So so yeah, we're canceling our young kids and look at the result of that. But it, we're hurting people, and harming them. We're canceling because I, I don't think people want to have those conversations and those difficult conversations. It's easy to cancel somebody than to say, bro, you did this Let's wrong. Let's talk about right. it. Yeah. Exactly right. It's, yeah, a, it's a shortcut. It's a moral shortcut. Well, I want to about... pull some stuff out of what he said, though. Uh, two things. Do you think it would be fair if Justin Fairfax was forced to resign before Governor Northam? If the evidence leads to that, yes. Yeah. I mean, if the evidence suggests that, then he's got to be held accountable, right? And those two things sit on their own tub, on mm -hmm. their own bottom, right? We can't say that, oh, look, the black man had to retire before, uh, resign before the black, white man did uh, because they ain't holding him accountable. No, if the evidence clearly leads uh, to implicating Justin Fairfax and what he did, he must go. On the other hand, he must be given due process. When he says, let the FBI investigate, isn't this what we said in mm -hmm. regard to Kavanaugh? Look at the horrible Kavanaugh hearings and, you know, uh, Dr. Halsey Ford and so on, um, uh, Dr. Ford, and, and what happened in, in that situation. So we say, yes, let's bring somebody in. Let's look at what happened. Let's look at the evidence. Because at the same time, we can't just dismiss the man based upon the words of the women we believe. We can believe them. We can have a morally efficacious witness. And the evidence seems to be so compelling by these women that we have to take it seriously. Okay, let's do that. Let's investigate. Let's look at what happened. Because you know the second woman, Miss I think it's Miss Watson, claims now that not only was she raped by Justin Fairfax, but that the former NBA star Corey Maggette raped her as well. Mm. I think he had he was taken off. I don't know if he is an announcer for the Clippers or somebody. He was then removed from that. The question is, yes, do we compensate for years and decades and indeed centuries of not listening to women? of refusing to acknowledge their humanity. Do we compensate that for, for that now by every charge is taken equally without compelling evidence available? I'm not saying in this case there's not, because you have the Dr. Vanessa Tyson making an extraordinary uh, testimony and, and uh, the second accuser. But I'm saying, can we put it in a context where that evidence is weighed, looked at, sifted through? And if we fail to do that, I think black people come out the worst because we have lived in a culture that has refused to acknowledge they ain't never believed blackness, ain't never believed black people, and they ain't believe what black people said or what black people did. We have literally seen the transcripts in courtrooms of that failure or in moral courtrooms where black people have been dismissed out of hand without being taken seriously. I'm just saying we got to be a bit more cautious about proceeding. Now, what do you think about, you know, us canceling Super Bowl halftime and us canceling mm -hmm. Gucci and Prada and Montclair and... See, the, 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 the Super Bowl halftime to me is complicated. Let me tell you why. I think when Jay-Z refuses to go, that's huge. When Rihanna refuses to go, that's huge. And I think they should stand with their principles, and I stand with them, right? Jay-Z is a friend of mine. Love him, love his consciousness, love his commitment of conscience to our cause. And refusing to participate was a huge statement. Travis Scott, not so much. Travis Scott doesn't do it, the next Negro up. We'll, we'll stand in that place, right? So the thing is, or, or people want to cancel Gladys Knight. Gladys Knight is 74 years old. <laughs> Recognize her game. Recognize what she's meant to this culture. Midnight Train to Georgia. Go get Farrah Jasmine Griffin's book, Who Set You Flowing, to look at her examination of immigration narrative, black, and black migration narratives, and how the music, in part, set the terms for our own self-understanding in that. Gladys Knight. Midnight Train to Georgia, written ironically by a white man, right, who used to play football, the quarterback at University of Mississippi when when my man was trying to get into Mississippi, uh, Brother James, and then he becomes a songwriter who writes many of, of Gladys Knight's greatest hits. But 
The thing is, is that when you, when you think about canceling Gladys Knight, she's wait a minute. Even if you think she made a mistake, I didn't agree with the statement she made about the anthem. That that was I, I didn't agree with that, but I agree with the fact that Gladys Knight is such a huge figure who should be seated legitimacy, right? Talking about believe women. What women do we believe? What Do we believe Gladys Knight? Do we believe <laughs> Candace Owens? Mm-hmm. She's a black woman too, right? <laughs> so the thing is, we got, to, we got to test the durability of their truth and the insight that they bring. Gladys Knight is a 74-year-old black woman who was fought before some of these people were born. She got the cachet. She got the cachet. She got the cash. She got the, you know, she got the rigorous uh, testimony to what she has been committed to. So, and, and plus, Atlanta is a black city with a black mayor, right? Meek Mill was there that weekend talking about criminal justice reform. It's complicated. There are multiple streams of resistance. Thurgood Marshall was in the courts. Martin Luther King Jr. was in the streets. What happened to the inside-outside game? Everybody can't be the point guard. Somebody got to be the forward. Somebody got to be the center. We got to have multiple streams I've of been consciousness. I've that, man. But when black people cancel, I cancel you because I disagree with your, with your style and your route. I think that's problematic. It doesn't mean that there aren't black people who sell us out. There are many of them. Clarence Thomas. Ben Carson, right? We can talk about that. But others would say, wait a minute, let's be more cautious about saying that. But I don't believe in canceling them. I don't believe in eradicating them. I believe in engaging them. If we can talk to white supremacists across the table, Martin Luther King Jr. sat down and negotiated with white supremacists. You mean we can't do the same thing for our brothers and sisters? We have to cancel you out? We refuse to cancel Bull Connor because we use Bull Connor as a prop in the theater of our black resistance. So now you're telling me we can't disagree with each other while saying, I hate you, I think you are so wrong. Look, I can disagree with you, I can think you're wrong, but I don't have to hate you, I don't have to cancel you. So I think when we look at the Super Bowl, that was a far more complicated affair than we made it to be. And look, look at what happened in in, in, in the scene squabbles. So Colin Kaepernick, my man, whom I love, and Eric Reed, my man whom I love, right? Eric Reed got into a fight rhetorically, ideologically with Malcolm Jennings. Malcolm Jennings is doing the work in Philadelphia. He's talking about criminal justice reform. He's talking about cash bails. He's speaking about the ways in which the system of of justice for black people is fundamentally flawed and using his resources, took the $100 million, right, that group of his players, fellow players, from the NFL to say, we're going to leverage this in defense of our practices. How can they feel like he's sold out, though. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah, they feel like Malcolm sold, sold them out. But Malcolm, th- this is my point about the cancel culture, about mm-hmm. the sellout language, right? Martin Luther King Jr. was called a sellout. Yeah. Did he sell us out? That's true. Let me think. I think he didn't. But at the time, people thought that. Why can't we do both hands? Why can't we say Malcolm do this, Martin do this, Fannie Lou Hamer do this, Ella Baker do this, we all do it together? How come you can't do something, somebody else can't do something, I can't do something? We say, look, we're dealing with the same elephant. It's many parts of yes. it. Can I deal with this part? You deal with that. Look. I used to work in a in a in an automobile factory. I was a welder. I was working on the wheel brake drums. Hey man, how come you ain't working on the windows? That ain't my job. My job is the wheel brake drums, homeboy. You get the window. Somebody else get the tailpipe. We put the car together. Break, been to build the car. Yeah. Right? Why you gonna cancel me? Cause I ain't working on the tailpipe. Mm-hmm. How come you mad at me? You're a sellout. Why? Because you're not working on the steering wheel, bruh. That ain't my job. So I think that we have intolerance for complexity, division of labor, and everybody ain't got the truth. The great Howard Thurman, a great, great preacher and prophetic mystic said, you can go to the Atlantic Ocean. You can dip your glass in the Atlantic Ocean. It may be full of the Atlantic Ocean, but it's not all the Atlantic Ocean. We are not exhaustive in our approach to truth. We have to have enough humility to acknowledge other people might have different ways. Let's not call everybody a sellout. Look what I mentioned earlier. Everybody loved Whitney Houston. Now, oh, my God, Whitney, we miss you so much. Oh, really? Did you miss her when black people were saying you a sellout because you singing that white music mm-hmm. and you ain't doing us right? They called Michael Jackson a sellout. Every black, they, they were talking about Beyonce initially. Look at her, lightening her skin. She's on the cover of magazines. Is she dealing with white people? Do they love her much? And then she getting shut out of the Grammys. And then Adele stands up and says, what does she have to do? Be black and British like you? Be white and British like you? Not be who she is? Look at the blackness Beyonce has brought. One of the most effective representatives of blackness in the modern era. She turned Coachella into Baychella with black rituals drawn from HBCUs. What's blacker than that? And yet we are so intolerant. Why? Because we are so desperate. We are so traumatized. Any expression has to represent all expression. One film. You know what you didn't do in that film? (laughs) Negro is one film, right? This is what I love about Jordan Peele, from what I can tell, right? Get Out is about them, 
about how whiteness absorbs black bodies and rearticulates them as cogs in the machinery of their white supremacist agenda. So it, 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 it lusts after us. It appropriates our blackness for its purposes. Now he's got us. Us. This is going to be about us. Now, mm-hmm. Oh. And how we're our own worst enemy. Hello? Yeah. Can we do both? Can we both acknowledge white supremacy's virulent assault and sometimes finding our minds as beachheads for its most effective work? And at the same time, what we do to each other. Let's let's do both and not either or. And 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 look, I didn't been called a sellout so often. Look, when I went to talk to Bill Maher on HBO, Negroes read me for filth. You coon ass nigga, you sellout. It's after he look said, at all you do. Nigga. It's after he said yeah. nigga, right? And I said, can we talk to people? Do we have to throw people away? Do we have to dispose of people, especially allies? Can we say, you know what you did was wrong and we won't hold you accountable? I try to be a feminist, but clearly. I'm flawed in my feminism. I want women to hold me accountable. But did you have to throw me away? Mm. Do you have to just dismiss me and say what you're doing is wrong? Like did, all the work I've done at 23 years old, getting kicked out of a church because I'm trying to ordain black women, writing books about black women when people th- felt uncomfortable because I celebrated that. When I celebrated the rise of dark skinned black women in a, in a political economy of desire within black culture where where light, bright and almost white was acceptable, but darkness was demonized. I mean, all the history written in my body, written in the work I've done is dismissed because of one flaw. The Reverend Jesse Jackson said, when you judge somebody, you can't look at one game. You got to look at the box score. You got to look at the season average. You got to look at, you know, I might have struck out five times in this game, but I still led the major leagues in batting. And think about it. When you're the leading batter in the major leagues, you might bat 350. That means out of every 10 pitches, you miss seven of them. This is the humility we have to have when we approach each other. So I think that we have to have an open mindedness. We can hold each other accountable, but you, you a sellout. You a, you did this. You, you betrayed black people. That doesn't get us far because the very people calling them that betrayal. Look at Malcolm X. Malcolm said, I know what they're going to do to me because mm-hmm. I helped do it to other people. Mm-hmm. So now we miss that part. We're making the same mistakes as our forefathers. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and black lives matter. I love them. We're going to be different than you older Negroes. Black lives matter is as fractious and divided <laughs> And this faction over here loves this, and this one over here hates this, and you will sell out. This is the same language. That's what I mean. The analog reality then crept up into the digital age. Mm. You might be a digital native, but you got analog habits. Mm. And so the question is, how do we grapple with it? It's not generation, it's genre. If you were a kind of Negro 50 years ago who believed in black nationalism, you're a Negro 50 years later who believes in it. It ain't your generation. It's the particular orientation you have. Or if you were an integrationist, right? And then they called, you know, Malcolm X dog king. You know, farce on Washington. Oh, okay. So he said, he said to King, I would never be a kind of coward who would allow women and children to suffer. Okay. So are you going to supply the men who will stand in there? Stead? Because Malcolm also said he, he used to question the nation of Islam for not being about that action. Yeah, question them, dog, send but them you to ain't the south. there. Yeah, send them, to the, send them to the south so they can stand on the front lines. But you could have done that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you're going to talk about King, Tom Brady, let me tell you what. Oh, have you, have you been on that field? Oh, have you <laughs> slung that ball? Have you looked for Gronk, you know, in a cross cut? Have you seen a wide out go across the field and then threw him the ball and he got hit and then fell down? Or Julian Edelman, right? Have you have you done that? If you're doing it in theory, that's one thing. If you're holding people accountable I and mean, you ain't been on that field, that's another thing. Malcolm X, whom I love and wrote a book about, writing about King, talking about King as a coward and refuses to get in his place, that's cancel culture at its worst. Mm. That's the, the hypocrisy of calling somebody to account for something you're not willing to do. If you ain't willing to go down to Birmingham, Alabama, and here's the excuse. Well, the honorable Elijah Muhammad forbids that. Oh, okay. So now you got a built-in excuse. Mm. You know, hold me back, man. Hold me back. Yeah, yeah, hold me back. Because I don't want to, yeah, you don't want to get in that fight. So then if you can't get in the fight, stop dogging the people who are there. And I'm saying, if you don't like the book I write, write your own. If you don't like the song I sing, sing your own. If you don't like the protest I got, protest your own. See, what's wrong with you? We want to sit around on the sidelines casting stones at people rather than building together and doing something we think is effective. I, I got a couple more questions before we get mm-hmm. out of here. What do you think about all the backlash that Kam- Kamala Harris is receiving? I mean, she was on the greatest show in America yesterday, a couple of days ago, The Breakfast Club, where she yeah. broke it down. I mean... This, this is an example of what I'm talking about. Kamala Harris has been black from the giddy up. Mm-hmm. I've known Kamala Harris for 15 more or some odd years. Ain't nobody, qu- she's been black. She was black and fine. She was black and intelligent. She was black and showing up doing her thing. 
And whether you agree with her or not had nothing to do with her blackness. It's with her ideology. Maybe you disagree with the politics she has. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But don't question the blackness. Right? Mm -hmm. right? I ain't going to question Clarence Thomas's blackness. He black. He black in the most. <laughs> Hell, he blue black. Right? Which is why he hates Negroes at a certain level. Now, I'm conjecturing, and I know I'm going on a limb here. Clarence Thomas, born in Pointport, Georgia, probably has a problem with Negroes because as a dark-skinned black man, he was degraded and humiliated. My daddy was blue black. I'm a light-skinned Negro, curly hair with glasses. I saw how black people gave me a pass or an acknowledgement because I was light. I had light privilege, just like we did with white privilege. The Negroes don't want to deal with that, right? I'm not saying that light-skinned people don't get dissed as well, that, that you know, people say, you think you cute because you light. No, but you do, and thank you. So the so reality is it's complicated both ways, right? But we, the, to deny that I got light-skinned privilege, to deny that my brother who is darker, who's been in prison for 30 years, I'm not saying he went there because he was darker. I'm saying I saw the differential treatment accorded to him because of his darker skin. And if we can't acknowledge that, we are part of the problem. Having said that, when we think about the broader landscape of race, we, Clarence Thomas is so hateful because he was treated so hatefully. I don't deny Clarence Thomas's blackness. You can be black all day long. I deny the hateful animosity of your conservative reactionary beliefs that undermine black communities. That ain't about your blackness. That's about your ideology and the way in which you deploy that ideology to hurt other black people. So to deny Kamala Harris, again, are we going to repeat that sin? Are we going to repeat that play? You know, I'm Is blacker than you. I mean, it's yeah. the same thing. Now, let's be honest, though. Another thing, talking about being self-critical here, the reason she catching some hell is because black people done had a little buyer's remorse on Barack Obama. That's a fact, 100%. Mm -hmm. like, like, oh, we saw that play before now. We saw when you were sketchy about whether you're going to be black or not. Right? We, we haven't even held Obama to account. The same people that want to hold black people to account in this generation, cancel culture, and with the Me Too, which is extremely important, ain't saying nothing about the passage in Michelle Obama's book where she went whole hog against Jeremiah Wright in one of the most misrepresentative pieces of of literature we've seen in the last five years. Yeah, I didn't I didn't agree with that either. Because it's like they loved <laughs> Jeremiah Wright at one point, but when it became bad for business mm -hmm. politically, they wanted to stand to the side. I didn't I don't like that. I'm How like, why, and, and why are you still doing that in the book? Like y'all not in the you, office. You no more? selling a billion copies. I love Michelle Obama yeah, like the rest yeah, of us, yeah, right? Yeah. Float is forever. I'm down with you, but wait a minute. We ain't got to get down with you crapping on Jeremiah Wright. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you something else. I was at that church at the same time they were. I was a member of that church. He preaching them sermons every Sunday, dog. Don't say you wasn't there. Stop. Because <laughs> he was doing it every Sunday. Yeah. Now, you can disagree with Jeremiah Wright. You can say, hey, you're a bit too acerbic in your critique. You offer some personalized reflections that I find offensive. You can do that. The dude's a rhetorical genius. He's a verbal master, speaks eight languages, was a graduate student at the University of Chicago under the tutelage of the great Charles Long, one of the greatest masters of black sacred rhetoric we have. I'm sitting in the room here with Dr. Freddie Haynes, another one. I know he's going to be on your show soon. Another a master of black sacred rhetoric. So you in your book will misrepresent. And let me tell you what she did since y'all go. Yo, I'm, I'm already tripping. Let me trip some more. The, the thing that Michelle Obama, to me, did wrong in that book, she drew a parallel between Barack Obama's grandmother, who probably broke off a couple of N-words and said some stuff, and he admits it. She said some politically incorrect stuff about black people, suspicious and skeptical of black men, in the, but, but Barry, your grandson, mm -hmm. is black. Drawing a parallel between what his, his grandmama did and what her grandfather did because he was angry at what white people had done to black people. That ain't no parallel. Mm. See, and this is what Obama did. What we may have to reckon with when black people said, hey, Michelle Obama's going to make him blacker. Then we got to ask what happened? Did he make her whiter than she made him blacker? Is that mm. the terms? Well, if you want to put it that way, no. I think Michelle Obama is as black as a black woman could be in this world. Beautiful, eloquent, intelligent, brilliant, breaking, breaking records with her book. But we also have to say you didn't have to be gratuitous in your assault upon a man whose church you were a member of. Because wait a minute. If it was such a problem, how come you leave the church? If it was such a problem, how come you didn't lose your membership? You know, well, I didn't hear it then. Come on now. I was there. I was heard it. <laughs> Jeremiah Wright was on that stuff every Sunday. Yeah, he didn't just turn that on. Dog. Like, <laughs> he be kicking them ballistics every Sunday. So 
Having said that... Same reason they buried the picture of Barack and Farrakhan. Come on, right, exactly, you know. And then you can be critical of Farrakhan. Look, I had a meeting with Farrakhan, and I said, Mr. Minister Farrakhan, you know I've been very critical of you about anti-Semitism and about homophobia. My brother, if we don't hold each other to account and correct our brothers, how else can we grow? I said, cool, That's maybe real. he ain't gonna murk me. <laughs> Maybe I'll have a meeting yeah, yeah. and I can come out alive, mm -hmm. right? I disagree with you. I disagree with what you said, but I understand the value of you to black people. But Michelle Obama gratuitously assaulting Jeremiah Wright is offensive in the nth degree. But we, where, where's the cancel culture? At? Cancel Michelle? Are you going to cancel Michelle? Well, a lot of people Are you going to cancel Michelle? A lot, don't, they don't, don't, that, that digital era don't know about Jeremiah Wright. But see, that's my point. Yeah. Something you just said, don't know. And ain't, and ain't trying to know. Mm -hmm. And ain't trying to ask what they don't know. This is my problem with digital culture. On the one hand, it's brilliant. It puts an entire library at your keystroke. That's the genius of digital culture. What took me days of going to the library mm -hmm. and pulling out the card catalog and looking at the reader's periodical and looking up those articles now can be sent to me through a text. Here's the article right here from 50 years ago. And no more That's encyclopedias. Remember, we all had all encyclopedias that. at mm -hmm. home. But see, but then the browsing is cut off. So when you mm -hmm. go to the card catalog, you're looking for the book. Oh, I was looking for Charlemagne's book. But I discovered DJ Envy's book, I discovered Angela Yee's book, or I discovered Du Bois, or or I discovered you know Manning Marable or Kimberly Crenshaw or Farrah Griffin or Salamisha Tillett, you know I discovered something else because I was looking and I think again the the illusion of omnicompetence that the digital culture gives you it believe it makes you believe because I can wield a keystroke I can say something ooh. I said something bold and I can cut somebody out or I can I can I can shade them. Look at the shades of meaning, not the shades you can give. Facebook, I had to face the book and read it. Mm. Look at the digital era's genius, but look at its subversion of tradition and apprenticeship. You know, I, I had a PhD from Princeton and was carrying Jesse Jackson's bags. I was writing his autobiography for him. I didn't go, oh my God, I didn't get a PhD from Princeton to carry Jesse Jackson's bags. No, I got a PhD from Princeton so I could serve my people. And the initial apprenticeship I had was serving as his writer and a guy who was helping him out. And I can't tell you what I've learned from Jesse Jackson in the last 30 years has been extraordinary. There is no sense of apprenticeship that you can't have it now. Everybody shouldn't be famous. Everybody shouldn't have a platform. Everybody doesn't have the capacity to speak well at a particular time. And we should acknowledge that. Just because you have access to that particular forum doesn't mean you got something profound to say. Should it democratize expression so that people that you want to rule out have something to say? Absolutely. But you got to have the bona fides. You got to have the chops. You got to have the ability once you get in to show you deserve to be there. Back to your point about Kamala Harris. It's ridiculous. Judge her based upon her performance. Judge her based upon her politics. Judge her based upon what she will or will not do. But to dismiss her as not being black enough, we done been down there. Well, we done been there and done black before. Let's figure out more complicated and nuanced ways to engage a figure like Kamala Harris. What, what should the black agenda be? Because a lot of people are saying we're not even <laughs> thinking about voting in 2020 if these candidates don't have a black agenda. Okay, just get what you already got then. Right, look, 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 talking about the black left, I'm part of the black left. I had huge arguments with the black left last election. Ain't no difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. How you like it now? You, are you telling me mm -hmm. that you don't think, as flawed as Hillary Clinton was, as problematic as you thought she was, that Hillary Clinton was no different than, than Donald Trump? This is the trauma and, pr and problem and tragedy of so much of our politics. And again, for younger black people getting involved, it didn't turn out my way. Welcome to the world. You got to fight again. You got to get up again. Not voting in 2020 is ridiculous if we don't get the people we want. This ain't Jesus versus Muhammad, right? This ain't no pure ecstasy of divine appropriation of human form to express identities. These are flawed human beings who are jacked up like you and I are, but some less so than others and some with better policies than others. Now, not just incrementalism. That ain't what I'm talking about. If Noam Chomsky, you ain't going to get no lefter than Noam Chomsky, and Angela Davis, you ain't going to get no more progressive than Angela Davis, both said, I'm for Hillary Clinton in the last election, while the ostensible, true, pure left can't get down with her, I ain't got nothing to say to you. We have to understand that, look, in the in every year, I'd, I'd love when I, I was riding for Kobe and the Lakers, I want, every year I want the Lakers versus the Boston Celtics. 
But that year it was the Golden State Warriors versus the Cleveland Cavaliers. Who in the game? Not what you want to be. Not the team you want to be there. Who do you handicap of the people running? We have to vote for the people we have available. We have to make them accountable to our interests. The black agenda should be what? Crime, reform, criminal justice reform is huge. The persistence of poverty is huge in this country. Voter suppression. Let's not ask Kamala Harris how black she is. Let's ask what policy she has to combat voter suppression in this country. Donald Trump won by what? Three to four million votes. That's in aggregate. He basically run by what? 80,000 votes in about three or four or five different states with the, um, the, with the, with the college, electoral the uh, college. electoral college there. So let's be strategic about that. He ain't got no overwhelming mandate. We did the right thing for the most part, but we got caught up in the math. Black women have tried to save this country. Black women voted in the 90th percentile, right, or percentage with, uh, for Hillary, black men in the 80s. White women who were eligible voters, 54% of them voted for Donald Trump. Here's a dude talking about grabbing it and a, a sexual predator, and yet we stood behind him. So my point is we'll never have perfect politics but we have to understand the need to get involved in the game. And if we lay back with that same attitude, look at the last election. People were putting in Harambe and filling in the blank of something <laughs> just to be voting for protests. This is what the right wing understands. You ain't just voting for Trump. You voting for the Supreme Court. Look how ingenious they were. There are now probably three choices that Donald Trump will have to shape that court. And if you don't think that makes a difference in your life, you are sadly mistaken. This is why it's extremely important for young people to get involved and for us to continue to vote. You ain't going to never have no perfect candidates, but you got to be perfectly engaged in the process. What did Grace Jones say? I may not be perfect, but I'm perfect for you. That's what we got to, that's the attitude we have to have when it comes to voting in this country. My All man. right. Well, thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure. Michael right. Eric Dyson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Michael Eric Dyson, baby. My brother. Bars. Bars. Don't y'all cancel him. Bars on bars. Please, please don't. <laughs> please, you don't, can't cancel. Please, please don't, don't cancel nobody cancel Michael, Michael Eric Dyson. 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 I, got, I got bills to pay and kids to raise. <laughs> Some people are uncancelable. Thank All you. Right. Love y'all. Breakfast Club. Good morning.